And I'm going to start letting people into the meeting right now. Welcome everybody. We will begin the discussion in just a moment. Oh, I know you are. Welcome everyone, we will begin in just a few minutes. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Colleen Stovall, and I'm the Director of Programs and Events for the Miami Center for Architecture and Design. I'd like to welcome you to the second in a series of roundtable discussions about urban redesign post-COVID. Just a little bit of light housekeeping before we begin. There's going to be a Q&A session at the end mm -hmm. of this discussion. And um, if you could um, uh, write your questions using the chat, um, using the chat feature, uh, at the bottom, uh, you know, the Zoom chat feature and address it to everyone and um, we'll get to your questions at the end. Please remember to keep yourselves muted and turn off your video um, and that will help us with a better, um, a better bandwidth and better feed for the um, video. Um, this meeting will be recorded and will be available to view on the AIA Miami website and the MCAD website uh, after Monday, July 20th. Before we begin, I'd like to introduce Jason Hagopian, the Vice President of MCAD and a principal with Tsao Design Group. Jason? Hey, everybody. Thank you, Colleen. That's true. My name is Jason Hagopian. Uh, it's a pleasure to be uh, introducing and, and giving a few little announcements today. Um, of course, you are signed up to, uh, for this urban redesign uh, session today, Urban Parks and Public Places. Uh, we just want to recognize the partnership we're having with the, Amer with the APA, the American Planning Association, for this series, uh, which includes topics such as cities, equity, parks and urban spaces, and mobility. Uh, some things that are happening uh, with MCAD. Uh, please keep your eye out for our book talks. Uh, we have one coming up 
on July 23rd at 7 p.m. Jose Galibert Navia will be discussing his book. It should be an incredible session. So if you don't have the information or haven't been getting any of our blasts, please go to our website, mcad.org, uh, uh, and you can find all the information. Uh, MiamiCAD.org, excuse me, MiamiCAD.org. Um, and if you're not getting our blasts every Wednesday, you should be. Every Wednesday, we send out a survival guide uh, with some helpful hints, some tongue-in-cheek, some useful information uh, to help you get through your week in this new uh, virtual world that we're living. Um, and also, very exciting, we have a, um, an online 3D, oh my goodness, excuse me, an online 3D exhibit at MiamiCAD.org, uh, Space Situations. It's really, really cool. Please go to our website and you'll see it, click on it you'll actually be transported virtually into our space downtown, and you'll get to view our current exhibit. And it's fully immersible, 4K, it's, it's amazing. So please check it out. And just stay tuned, uh, Urban Warriors is going to happen. It's just going to be an online, um, an online uh, event this year, and we will be releasing more information on that um, in the coming weeks. So stay tuned. So thank you, everybody. Uh, this should be an incredible session today. Thank you, Colleen. Look forward to seeing you all soon. Hi, everybody. I should have introduced you, Cheryl. I'm sorry. <laughs> and now I pass it off to Cheryl Jacobs, <laughs> our fearless leader. Uh, thanks, Jason. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Cheryl Jacobs, Executive Vice President here at MCAD and uh, AIA Miami. We're so happy to have so many of you on today, and um, we are we love our partnership with APA. Um, and I'm looking through the list to see if Juan is on uh, has called in to let him say. A few words but I don't see him so um, let me just say that this is a an ongoing partnership that we have with the Gold Coast chapter of APA and um, we look look uh, we look forward to many more uh, programs our next one of course is mobility and we'll be doing another one a little bit uh, down the road on redlining that I think you'll find really fascinating um, and I don't know, um, I see Caesar is on. Caesar, if you wanna say a couple of words about anything that's going on with APA before we get started. Um, sure, thank you for participating. We've really enjoyed this relationship with Cheryl and the AIA. We're looking forward to doing more of it. Um, as with everybody, we're having a lot of um, non-in-person events through APA, so we will, uh, get the uh, information from everyone who's attended here and make sure to add you to our list and we hope you enjoy the show. Thanks. Thanks, Caesar. So let me bring up our um, panelists. If you guys would unmute and start your videos. Um, thank you. So uh, in no particular order of importance because you all are wonderful and immensely important. Uh, let me introduce Maria Nardi, who is the Director of uh, Parks, Recreation, and Open Spaces of Miami-Dade County, and there's probably more words in that title, Maria, but you know, uh, you can tell us when you, when you come on, but welcome. Uh, Ibru Ozer, who is an Associate Professor at FIU and the Landscape Architecture and Environmental and Urban Design Department. And uh, then also let me bring in Christopher Counts, who is the Director of Landscape Architecture in the Miami Office of Perkins and Will. So welcome all of you. Thank you for taking the time uh, to participate on, 
in this um, panel. So I thought I would start with something really easy and uh, ask you, what would you like our participants to know about you? Um, just in a, 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 you know, a few uh, words. Chris, you want to start? Um, okay. Um, You're stuck? Yeah, yeah, sorry. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, just in general, I mean, I, I'm, I'm new. Uh, I've been down here about a year. I just joined Perkins and Will. My, uh, had my own office in, in Brooklyn for about 10 years and before that with Michael Van Valkenburg. And a lot of my background and expertise, I guess, if you want to use that word, uh, is in uh, public space and um, urban parks. Thanks. Uh, Maria? Sure. Thanks, Cheryl, actually, for the invitation. And hello, everyone. I see a lot of familiar face uh, names and uh, on the screen there. I look forward to seeing most of you, all of you, those of you that I know, hopefully in the near future in person. So uh, a little bit about uh, that I'd like for you all to know about me. Um, I'm trained as an architect and a landscape architect, and I've been working in the public sector for um, a long time, close to 17 years. And I really consider the public sector uh, still the frontier for having an impact in the health and transformational qualities that uh, architecture, landscape architecture, and urban design can have on a community. Um, I now lead the Parks Department, which is the third largest park system in the country. And we're guided by a master plan that is really about bringing the entire 35 municipalities and the community together to implement a single vision about uh, transforming Miami-Dade County into something really extraordinary. And it goes beyond parks. It really looks at parks and public spaces and natural and cultural areas, connecting them with greenways and blueways and designing our streets as linear parks. Um, from this vision, we've been able to implement much of what uh, you'll be seeing in, in the coming uh, years. And, um, you know, one of the things that I think uh, we're very fortunate is that we're being, we're engaging a lot of community leaders to really uh, take pieces of that and implement them. So we've got 160 miles of a 500 mile of connectivity plan that's in the works and there's so much more. So. That is in a nutshell, in a quick nutshell. So, I, and also I'm glad to see that you called in from your office on the beach today. Yes. So, so that's, yes. uh, one, that's of, one of uh, Miami-Dade County Parks is, uh, manages uh, a lot of uh, parks. This is one of them, which is the longest linear park in all of the county, which is 17 miles of beaches from government cut to Broward County Line, it's our longest linear park. That's great. Ibru? Hello, thanks so much for having me. Um, I am an associate professor in the Landscape Architecture and Environmental Urban Design program of, of FIU. Um, I am an architect. I practice architecture in Istanbul five years prior to my landscape architecture education at LSU. And I am a PhD candidate in civil engineering. I would like to learn more about uh, stormwater management, which is focus of my research. Um, I am a co-principal of a landscape architecture design firm located in Coral Gables called Landscape DE with my partner, Douglas Thompson. And I study uh, parks and green spaces, and I do landscape performance analysis of public open spaces, which included um, Soundscape Park, Lincoln Road Mall, and also Pampano Beach open space, streetscape and restoration projects. Um, my partner and I design um, playgrounds specifically uh, for the Miami-Dade County. Parks and Recreation and Open Space Department, and we uh, focused on creating nature-based playground designs during the last several years and closely work with Maria Nardi. So that's, that's great. And I, that's great, and thanks. And I, I, we pulled this panel together without 
no, without me knowing that. So it's kind of an interesting, um, you know, synergy. And uh, you know, we as as big as our industry is, it's also very small. Um, that is, uh, uh, you know, that when we find out there's so many people that know each other, that work with each other, that um, uh, that are working with each other now. So it's really nice to uh, nice to see that. I wanted to go right into, you know, the kind of the question um, that everybody is talking about is how has the pandemic uh, affected maybe how you look at design uh, in terms of parks, uh, urban parks and public spaces and and maybe how you, uh, you know, how you're thinking of, uh, of maybe making uh, changes now. I thought I'd start um, with you, Chris. Okay. Um, yeah, wow. So that's the, that's a, um, you know, really interesting question. Um, everyone's thinking about it. Um, how has it changed? Um, I, I think it's, I mean, for me, I, I, it, I think it, I see it as an opportunity uh, to leverage uh, this movement combined with all that we were wrestling with relative to climate change. Um, and now other, uh, you know, other issues like Black Lives Matter and equity and all of these things kind of coming to better, com coming together to coalesce to actually do what I think <laughs> is very simple. It's almost like, I think we need to be doing things that we probably already should have been doing, right? <laughs> um, you know, I, there's obviously, you know, the, the inequity for public space uh, is a challenge here. It's a challenge for um, kind of all cities, but this kind of crack, if you will, you know, started to look at repurposing, um, you know, city streets, for example, which we have the benefit of like the 1960s, all of our traffic engineers over engineered a lot of our cities. And that was kind of a movement that started before um, COVID, right? Especially in uh, New York City started a bunch of that and this kind of guerrilla infill. And I think that's kind of, uh, kind of picking up on lessons learned from that. I think is important and also to recognize that like we've got some real challenges, you know, our cities, we don't need to go down the list of, of how we can improve them, but you know, um, streets in particular are interesting and just kind of like looking at the map, there was 50 or 60% of most cities are streets and parking, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of ideas. Um, and then just the second piece, um, that I've kind of maybe surprised myself. This I was on another panel uh, recently and asking some similar questions, and I kind of came to a conclusion that a lot of, you know, if we if we if we work backwards from from public from fundamental public space urban park kind of lessons and, and and kind of best practices, if you will, I think we kind of already stay about six feet apart. I mean, before it was, you know, more about like you know people are interacting and. Um, you know, uh, you wanted to give people options so they feel safe and feel invited because you, you're around people you didn't know, right? Um, you know, with the exception of, you know, we've seen the little dots on the high line and, and there's, there's a gradient there, but I think that there's a lot um, of just kind of general public space principles, again, that we just need to do more of that are out there that actually dovetail with a lot of the kind of technical uh, objectives as well. Yeah, you know, and in terms of public spaces, um, our sidewalks and streets are public spaces. You know, we don't necessarily think of that in terms of how we design. And uh, well, not the designers, but the uh, a lot of the electeds don't think of their cities that every place is a public space. Um, but Ibru, you want to comment on the uh, changes maybe of how you're looking at things? Yes, so I think there was a moment that when I was a student at LSU and after graduation when I'm teaching, we really looked at um, creating uh, pocket parks and value of neighborhood parks and uh, equal accessibility for everyone. And, and I think we gave a little thought to connectivity of those spaces. And because of COVID-19, this necessity of movement, 
instead of staying in stationary places, kind of like reminded us one more time that the importance of connectivity, importance of trail infrastructure that we back in our cities and towns. And, and as part of my studies at FIU with my students, we always look at trail infrastructure and we try to actually connect these open spaces to one another. It really, COVID-19 proved that really you don't want it to go to the same park, even if it is just a walking distance to your neighborhood. You really want it to see, since you are yours by yourself, with your immediate family, you at least want it to move and go with your bike or by walking to different places. I think reminded us this COVID-19 situation reminded us we need to invest more into our connectivity, connecting infrastructure. You know, thanks, Zebra. You know, Maria, uh, that makes me think of our active design program. And I, I know that you've been a big supporter of that. And that was one of the uh, concepts uh, connectivity and, and how we look at our public spaces. You want to comment on that? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So I totally agree with everyone saying, um, and a couple of things, you know, what comes to light for me after all of this to start off with is that um, not just as a parks director, but as uh, somebody that just sincerely has a strong conviction that parks are going to help save the planet and i don't mean that just as a, a you know something to say but i'm talking about this integrated systems that we are learning that we have had we have proof of concept in cities where you have the green infrastructure and how that has shaped communities um, and 10 years ago you know we set out to talk with the community and ask them what they want to live a better life in miami-dade county and what came out of that over you know hundreds of meetings and you know uh, much much input is that community wanted connectivity they wanted a vision that the minute you step outside your doorstep you're in a great park system and it starts with the sidewalk with the street connecting to pocket parks connecting to uh, neighborhood parks to regional parks to the everglades and biscayne bay a completely integrated network. And I think that we are really fortunate that we have that as a, as a network, as a vision working towards that. I think what we need to really embrace, and this is really great that's being hosted by AIA, because I think one of the things that needs to be bridged uh, and needs to be continued to bridge is the relationship between architecture and landscape architecture. Uh, and I think it's gone a very, very long way for, you know, from the past years that landscape architecture, I think more now than ever, is an integral part of the design of architecture. Uh, it is no longer part of the residual space that you just beautify, but it's an integral part that talks about system design and it talks about, you know, uh, the uh, actually the the quality of, uh, of life for uh, many of those of those projects. In housing projects, I don't think it's any surprise when we see the advertisement of not the actual building itself, but people walking in a green space. I mean, that is what's drawing people into those environments. So I think that that is something that's really important. Uh, I think active design is an integral part of that, that everything that we design, much like in architecture, we think about the what typically is the back of house of, of, a, of a project in terms of a stairwell for a public building becomes the center part of, of, of the design, something to be celebrated. I think that the translation for parks and public spaces is that active design has to be integrated into the connectivity and the mobility of people in a community for walking, cycling, and um, you know, to a park. Uh, the goal, as part of the um, you know the this Miami-Dade County's vision for uh, a, a livable community, is that you should be able to walk to a park ten minutes from where you live. So the acquisition of land and then the subsequent ability to build on that, I think, is critical for us to really. Um, realize uh, sustainability and walkability and active design and the transformation of this community through parks. Yeah, thanks. Chris, I saw you nodding. 
or were you just well, kind I, of rocking in your chair? No, well, kind of both, but um, <laughs> uh, I, I couldn't agree more. Absolutely. Um, um, I mean, it's just kind of funny, and, and I, I really appreciate where you, you bring up the, you know, especially me working in an architecture company. That you know, this relationship between architecture and landscape architecture is really something that we need to talk about. And um, we have a different skill set. We have a different. Um, the medium is different. We have a different craft, um, and uh, it does things different than architecture. You know, I I think it's so interesting that um, you know if we think about okay, so what's happening with the pandemics? Well we're realizing that um, you know, within, within buildings, um, we do have some challenges with, 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 with social distancing, distancing and stuff. But I would argue that like the original social distancing is these kind of car centric, it's not just Miami, it's, it's any, most new cities in the United States. We kind of socially distance um, uh, in, in this kind of car culture. And I, um, you know, I think that Again, you know, looking at this as an opportunity for really implementing change is something that I'm most excited about. And I think that, you know, what, what the pandemic has is, is demonstrated, I mean, I think what Maria said is absolutely true. It's true of every city. We should, again, these, these are things that we, we all need, we need to be doing this COVID or no COVID, right? Um, but if there's a way that we can kind of leverage this, I think it could be um, really exciting because there will be future pandemics and I think we're starting to see real math on, um, you know, imagining up, op, open spaces and park systems is this kind of uh, a pressure release valve, if you will. Like we need this. It's critical to our economy, to public health. Uh, I think you could even say national security. So um, kind of getting the ball rolling and getting getting some traction on this, this type of, uh, obviously Maria's been doing a great job of this already but uh, adding to that uh, collectively and leveraging op multiple opportunities that, need, that are going on at the same time. But especially, you know, um, this kind of rediscovery, if you will, that we've done as, as a society of the importance of, of, of public space, of shade, of connection to nature. I mean, it's in our DNA. We're actually wired, not only connect to nature, but to connect to people. It's directly related to our happiness, our public health and our, physical and economical and emotional well-being. Yeah, you know, I, one of my questions was to talk about um, this and quality of life. So you just kind of uh, answered the importance of this to of this kind of design, uh, you know, incorporating this, uh, our public spaces and parks uh, as an important part of our design to uh, increasing our quality of life. Um, as a, as a, private practitioner and then also as a professor. Are you discussing a lot of the um, issues around physical distancing and looking at designing things a little bit differently with your students? We will. Uh, it just came about the time that we were about to finish the semester last spring and our full semester in design studios will start in August. But among our colleagues, we already started having some discussions related to that. Um, for a number of years, we actually told our students how you can actually create seating arrangement that brings people together. So we really tried and forced how you can create gathering space that attracts people. So now we need to think a little different. We need to think about flexibility of use. We need to think about how we can actually, uh, if needed, there is an alternative use for these big spaces. There is a possibility of division. And in, in the academic world, we need to focus on these kind of like maybe flexible elements, maybe movable elements, maybe, thinking about giving wider spaces, but not in expense of, you know, uh, losing some of our green spaces and hurting our nature in terms of stormwater infiltration. So how we are gonna uh, discuss these challenges and, and find solutions in the studio, I'm very excited and curious to see when our fall semester starts. In our practice also, we started thinking about how we can design, incorporate, what would we do uh, if COVID happened 
before we did this project. So we had some back and forth conversations with my partner too. And, and we realized that, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, we have been designing nature-based playgrounds for the Miami-Dade County. And, and nature is a place for you to explore. Nature is a place for you to stay maybe by yourself, maybe it is something that engages you while you are alone. So having this opportunity to children, uh, giving them things other than this sculptural playground elements in the, um, in the playground, sculptural structures in this playground, but having them different opportunities to explore in the site um, perfectly aligns with the necessities of COVID-19. You know, uh, and Maria, um, we kind of talked about this privately before, but I, uh, I'm wondering if you're looking at the master plan and seeing areas or ideas or concepts that you need to tweak based on now what's happening. Yeah, you know, I, I in general, I think that there's always room for improvement. Uh, I think the master plan in terms of its vision, I'm, I'm really confident that you know, we've developed a plan that reflects a shared vision for the community. I think the execution of those different pieces allows for the uh, adaptation to what we need. And in terms of, for example, if I was to look at a park now in response to some of the questions in the chat uh, room there, you know, in response to if I was to look at a park, I think one of the things that I would look at in terms of uh, the design, like Ibru, uh, you know, mentioned, is look at capacity issues and access issues to uh, certain locations. So the ability to control number of people that go into a park becomes more critical than ever. And even pre-COVID, I think those are issues that are challenging when, you ma when you're managing a park. Now, being on this end of, you know, the other side of design, you know, uh, did design on the other side in terms of um, management, that's one of the challenges as well. And I think with COVID in mind, designing gateways, entry spaces that allow the flexibility of a beautiful entrance while also being a measure of guiding uh, traffics, whether it be patterns on a on a uh, the asphalt or patterns of access, ingress and egress, I think are going to be increasingly important to how we understand um, large spaces. So in a case like this, there's clear delineation of where you come in and where you exit and the ability to control enclosed spaces of, um, of uh, and, and modify number of people that use them. So I'm thinking of a concert space, a large amphitheater um, that we would need to be able to just, you know, corral people in the number of people that would be adequate for social distancing in this case. I do think that these these elements are long lasting. But what I think is interesting is that these are things that, uh, you know, many of us have been working on for uh, quite some time. And I, I think that that is actually um, uh, a natural uh, happening because uh, the nature of parks is that you're outdoor, you're in the safest place where you could be, you know, together and alone at the same time. So, you know, I think it's a continuum for landscape architecture. And um, for that, I think the development of how we think about streets as linear parks is something that has been happening for hundreds of years and we've got phenomenal models for it. I think it's now making that translation to here, um, you know, to Miami-Dade County, to other places in the country where we can have those adaptations of, uh, you know, uh, linear parks in our community. Yeah, and also I just wanted to let everybody know that we'll stop and uh, soon uh, because we have some really great questions in the chat and we're going to uh, bring those uh, to you guys in, in just a few minutes. Um, you know, uh, I, I think we, we sort of touched on this, but um, I think that it's important to kind of talk about um, how important quality of life is in a community and um, what are the kinds of things that 
uh, we can do as uh, citizens to help uh, our communities. Um, not all our, our electeds don't always think about the importance of money toward um, urban spaces and and parks and um, you know I think that there's a way that we uh, as uh, active people in our community uh, can reach out and and talk about that so um, Chris do you have some ideas around there I think just conversations like this and being an advocate um, um, Getting, keeping this conversation going, doing exactly what we're doing, I think it's really important. Uh, landscape architecture, public space, especially, I mean, Miami's a new city, right? Um, um, is not something that's on the tip of your tongue, if you will. I mean, when I first came down, uh, I think I, I told you this story, Cheryl, I, I was just um, amazed um, when, when COVID happened, and I, I live around the corner from the... Um, the, the little nine hole golf course in Coral Gables. And, um, you know, it didn't seem like, um, at least the people I was, was talking to, that parks was on the tip of anyone's tongue, but uh, COVID comes through, uh, the, the, the golf course closes, and overnight people are bringing their picnic tables, they're, they're, the kids are using the sand traps as, 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 um, uh, as like little sandboxes. It was beautiful, it was absolutely beautiful. Um, so, so they kick them I, I off. Think, you don't know well, exactly. Yeah, uh, that was <laughs> next week. Uh, yeah, I, I should have taken some pictures, but yeah, but it just happened naturally. Like it's just it's it's just kind of it's it's kind of built into our DNA. And I and honestly, I, I think also you know with this conversation, you know I I think um, relating this and well two things. One being cognizant of the work that we've done collectively within the United States in particular in terms of investing in urban parks over the last 10, 15 years has kind of been unprecedented. I mean, we can go through the list and I was lucky enough to work on a lot of them in New York and, and learn so much, but you know, that was, that's all kind of all new. And there's a lot of lessons learned and a lot of kind of uh, examples that we can point to in terms of, uh, of success stories. But I, but you know, one of the common themes of a lot of those projects is they are almost always you know, I think of like Brooklyn Ridge Park that's right in front of, you know, Brooklyn Heights, you know, one of the most wealthy, I think they said they had more lawyers per square foot than anywhere else <laughs> in, the, in the world or something like that. And that's great, but yet yeah, there's a pattern. It's all of these really great public, um, public spaces and urban parks, and they're almost always uh, associated with a, a very wealthy, uh, affluent community. And I think that you know the questions that are uh, being brought up correctly with, with with Black Lives Matter, for example, I think uh, are are really important to, to drill down on because the investment in um, in public space matters too. I mean, it, it sends a very clear signal of what your community, what your city, what your um, uh, the, the kind of government leadership uh, kind of feels about you. And you know, when you look at that kind of investment relative to things like the DOT or the airport, or think of like how many great park revitalization projects, and Maria's probably already onto this, but just as a idea um, out there, um, the bang for the buck that we could do in terms of improving people's quality of life, especially in underserved communities throughout the country, I think is, uh, could, cannot be understated. And uh, and again, I kind of feel like a broken record, but you know, leverage this opportunity because it may, um, well, let's just say that's our responsibility. Yeah, it is. And you know, that's one of the things that, um, that's why MCAT is here, you know, to right. make these conversations happen and to, to keep the conversation alive. But I'm gonna go to some of the questions now. So we have some really great questions. And one comes from, uh, my friend Larry Klein, and your boss, I think, Chris. Um, but I, uh, it's very interesting. Uh, it says um, COVID has prompted a call for returning some urban streets to pedestrian only to help social distancing and the creation of greater open space. Uh, do you see this as a trend that will continue? Ibra, do you want to um, address that? 
Yes, and I think we always, as landscape architects, we always believed in the value of streetscape design. And we spoke here and there in conferences, events, that streetscape is really, really important. But now, public in great. So they had the opportunity to explore our streets and see the benefit of utilizing streets when they cannot go to parks. So it brings the topic to equity aspect, you know, like do all our communities have equal access to uh, equal quality streets? So I live in Coral Gables. I'm fortunate to actually just walk several hours under well-shaded trees that makes me feel relaxed and the street is open and accessible and safe for me. But, but even in Coral Gables, and if I compare my phone street and the side street, and for example, Sunset uh, Drive versus maybe some of the Alhambra Drive, so the differences, traffic speed, differences of shade trees, differences of people's behavior and driving patterns uh, really affect how we can utilize streets. And, and we can also look at, just get out of, you know, Coral Gables and look at 7th Street and, and look at design and see what a single tree can actually do. What we can do all together by planting street trees, how we can convert those spaces to public spaces. And also we saw very recently that because of low traffic volume, a lot of streets converted to play areas. The basketball hoops came in. I photographed a lot of children playing tennis on the street, right? So people got used to utilizing streets and I am very really hopeful that they will ask for continuation of this. So they will say, this was a great experience. Can we do something more? I'm hoping that to get our streets back from cars. Uh, Maria, what do you think? I, I think this is going to be long lasting and I think it depends on everyone to make it so. I think one of the things that's really great about these conversations is that we get to chat about ideas and I think the big takeaway if I had to ask is that each one of us take away with us what is on your wish list and make it happen and the way it happens is to get engaged and get uh, engaged with your government uh, attend board meetings and make the asks um, and from you know a, a public sector and perspective is is make what we now have realized is essential part of the health infrastructure of our community make park systems a priority in our community we see the results in terms of how it transforms communities uh, socially, environmentally, and economically, let's make that a, an ask and a demand for um, our community moving forward. It's very true. You, you'd be surprised by uh, how, how the needle can change by having people, um, you know, by having our, our electeds uh, hear what uh, their constituents really want. And it, it, it takes that, it really takes that. I have another um, question. Chris, did you want to say something? Well, I was just going to say just, just as a minor point, just to add to, um, um, to this point. It, you know, it reminds me of, um, you know, there was so much pushback when, when Times Square, for example, was transformed into a public space. And what they did is they kind of did what Miami Beach is doing right now. You know, they kind of marked it off. Toronto did a similar thing as well when they were uh, uh, working on the waterfront. Where they just kind of kind of claimed it temporarily, if you will, uh, kind of as a experiment. And you know, two or three weeks went later went by, and everyone was fine, and it became permanent. I mean, they came and they paved it. It became so. This kind of taking notice of all of that, um, I think, is really you know, kind of factoring into that that mentality. Like, uh, guys, we can. Is it a little less convenient from a car? Uh, maybe. Does it still work? Yeah, yeah, it works. This it, is what it's, we're used to. It's true. That's why tactical uh, urbanism is so important. Let's get those, you know, those temporary projects up there and hope and find ways to make them become permanent. I know on the beach where I live, the Ocean Drive now is right. um, uh, they've got a lane, uh, you know, for emergency vehicles, but two lanes. And the parking is all um, open for the restaurants to put tables out and people to walk right. and 
seems to be going really well. There's another question Yeah, it's here. almost like part of, part of like an educational um, imperative, you will. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, so another question is many uh, projects emphasize the flexibility of a space and the role that plays in a community, but many projects take a long time before they're finished construction. So how long do you think parks and open spaces will take to adapt to current and post-pandemic post life? And um, uh, one, of, one of them is, you can answer that by how quick Miami Beach turned Ocean Drive into uh, a public, uh, you know, a, a street that uh, allows uh, pedestrians. So I don't know, Maria, do you want to respond to that? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I think it can happen. Um, there's there's both immediate responses and then the long term responses. I think there will always be an immediate response. And I think, you know, I would challenge us to think also not just in terms of design, but in terms of managing within the existing infrastructure of what we have. And I think there's some tactical solutions to that that have been put in place, how you manage traffic, how you manage you know, different aspects of the park and in parks that are very small where you need to accommodate more people, parking lots are being transformed into these plazas as we've known and learned for many years forever from cities, how they have that dual use. So in terms of, of, uh, of, of um, you know, the immediacy of those solutions, they can happen quickly. I think once again, by nature of what parks are, you know, the COVID solution, I don't think is is a one time solution. I think it's an ongoing aspect and a natural occurrence in art landscape architecture, right? Open spaces, uh, the way we travel through them. I think from a design perspective, they're actually, in my mind, without, uh, you know, the, the large projects that need to be implemented, they are about clarifying ingress and egress um, with the existing infrastructure. And I think those are things that can happen very quickly. On new and larger projects, I think it's taking those things into consideration. And probably one of the biggest challenges um, with right now, not just related to COVID, but also with climate change, is materiality and the type of materials that we use and how long lasting they are. And then add to another layer of how actually um, you know, how can we start thinking and using materials that, you know, are easy to clean or have properties in them that are uh, help with bacteria that are less porous and therefore easier to clean and don't sustain that. So I think the changes can happen quickly. I think there are changes that will take longer, um, but I think they're more systemic in the way we think about public space rather than the actual projects and implementations that happen in landscape architecture. So thanks, Maria. So there, um, I just wanted to let everybody know there are more questions that we're, than we're, we will have time for. But we're going to uh, take these questions, we're going to send them to our panelists and ask them if they would take a minute to answer some of them and then we can distribute that to, to um, everyone. Um, you didn't know you were going to have homework analysts, but uh, we'll, uh, we'll be kind when we send that. Um, so here's another interesting question. How do you think we can tackle the integration of architecture and landscape architecture on a deep level outside the interdisciplinary firms? How does the path toward that look like? And I think the word is collaboration that we need a little bit more. Um, Ibru, you want to address that? Yes, um, as I mentioned, I had training in both and I would say that I don't see a lot of difference. So we learn how to design and we learn how to design spaces. So I think the opportunity missed is just bringing these people together to collaborate from the very beginning. So I did not work with too many landscape architects when I was doing my architecture practice. And, and as soon as I studied, started studying landscape architecture and realized that we could tackle similar issues, although we look at different parts of the problem and system thinking, we tackle the same issue of design and how we can do these spaces usable for human use, uh, for environment, how we can do design. Um, so I think, as you point out at the beginning of your question, is just collaboration is the key 
aspect and I think I'm proud of my institution FIU doing this beautifully. Uh, we have School of Architecture that has interior architecture, landscape architecture and architecture department combined in same studio space under one roof. So our students doing vertical studios working together. When they graduate, they will know exactly who to work with, how to work with, how to interact with other disciplines. And I think um, they are getting this collaboration perspective from the core, from the very beginning of their design education. As, as educators, we are participating in each other's design reviews. Uh, we are functioning as school of architecture. So we are really uh, pushing for this collaboration uh, aspect of design uh, at FIU. So That's great. Um, we have another question from um, Victor Dover. Hi, Victor. Uh, what do you think of the Parks Without Borders initiative taken up by New York City Parks, where they've been removing their big iron fences that separated parks from surrounding uh, communities? Uh, could we have something like that in Miami Dade? Chris, you want to address that, and then maybe Maria too. You, you, you were breaking off a little bit. Uh, um, I, I think I know what you're talking about. In, in the, New York City Parks? Right, the Parks Without Borders initiative. Oh, right, right, right. Um, uh, I don't love it, personally. Um, I, I get the idea, but um, I think that, um, uh, and, I, and this is case by case basis, but the projects that I know about, I have some friends that work for the New York City Parks Department, for example, and, and I, 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 so I know a couple of examples that I, I, I wouldn't have done it for that. I mean, philosophically, does it make sense? Yes, right. But there's also something really nice. I think even Maria was mentioning, like when you enter an amphitheater or take Central Park, for example, it has a perimeter around the edge, right? Um, but it, it frames basic entrances, right? They kind of formalize it. It kind of recognizes the space as civic and important. And um, um, I, I think that there's, uh, but at the same time, you can jump over it. It's not a, it's not keeping people out. It's three or four feet tall. But there's something to that, the kind of psychological effect and the kind of framing of space and being special, as opposed to like some, um, like I think of some of the parks in, in, in Chicago, for example, which, which are were really part of kind of a green network system that's just kind of grass and lawn, uh, which is great, right? Uh, but it certainly didn't feel dignified or it didn't feel, um, didn't feel civic, if you will. So I, maybe I'm getting a little too detailed with that question, um, <laughs> but but I but I think there is something to have framing these spaces um, spatially and um, um, you know kind of experientially. Well, you know, maybe that uh, there's a difference between the big sometimes the big iron fences that go around something and a wall that that is not so high. Maria, do you have a um, Something yeah, no, I, add to I, um, I agree with Chris. I mean, I think that, uh, you know, in New York, given the density of the city and the many parks that have the fencing, I think uh, Parks Without Borders is, is uh, an important message in that community. You know, there are so many parks so close to each other, all fenced with iron uh, fence that are at least six feet tall. Um, for us, fences in Miami-Dade County are about three feet tall, two, two wood rail fence, while, you know, the aesthetics of it, I would, you know, as, as we grow in the system, I'd love, you know, uh, those coral rock gateways and to really um, celebrate the threshold, right, celebrate the civic aspect of entering a park while also maybe substituting some of that with plantings. Um, for our parks in Miami-Dade County, they are so large. We're talking about 270 acres. Let's let's look at one of our most urban uh, parks. Um, you know, in Tropical Park, it's a 275-acre park. So the perimeter is delineated with the two-rail fence, which doesn't really keep people out because you can, you know, cross Hop over. <laughs> but it, it delineates the boundaries of the park so that we don't have people just, uh, you know, driving in and driving through with on the grass. And, you know, it's a it's a it's a way of uh, delineating and emphasizing this is park land as almost like a branding, like a ribbon 
branding the park. Um, but I think if, if we were to have parks with large fences that sent the message, uh, stay out rather than come in, I would definitely consider that, yeah, important, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and it's true because uh, it's so much more pedestrian there than, uh, than with cars the way we are here that uh, I could just see people driving their cars into spaces that they weren't supposed to. Um, also, oh, really, go ahead, Ibra. I think it is related to cities infrastructure, how our cities in US made uh, in terms of width of the streets, where the edge of the park ends, is there a sidewalk next to the fence? You know, how we configure and design our cities really affect the answer of this question. When I take my daughter to Turkey in summers, none of our parks have fences around them and it was her first reaction that why these parks do not have fences around them and people around living around the parks they drive really carefully when they <laughs> close the park so it's related to people's habit in here we are actually loading this this uh, giving this responsibility to the fence people people behavior uh, is being limited by the fence. We should take our own responsibility and we should drive carefully next to our park. So that will show that parks without borders would work in Miami, but it is not gonna work with the numbers that excellent numbers that we are seeing here with the numbers of uh, crashes and, and driver habits and street infrastructure. That's true. You know, it's interesting how more people are biking now and walking. And I think part of that is due to the fact that so many of the gyms are closed for so long. But I live on the Venetian and every day when I come to work or go home, there's so much bike traffic and walking traffic, but bike traffic, that I don't think I ever get more than 20 miles per hour because, you know, you have to have your head on a swivel so we need we need more protected bike lanes. So that's a that's a whole other uh, co uh, conversation. But Venetian, uh, so. is, Venetian is part of our park system, as long with Rickenbacker Causeway. So we are working to turn those into parkways rather than causeways. Uh, that would be hmm. really great. Hmm. Um, so we have, we only have like four minutes left, and normally I end with a, a final thought. But there's a question here that I think would we could incorporate into your final thought that I think is really interesting. And it's in regards to the Black Lives Matter, how do parks and open spaces play a role in our communities to allow for protests? How would you incorporate social distancing in spaces that are intentionally meant to support gatherings? I think that's an interesting uh, way to kind of close our discussion. And uh, Chris, you want to address that? Yeah, that's it's interesting. It's, uh, emphasizing the, the, the kind of the town square, if you will, or the, or the public plaza. Um, but in Miami, we have like a different kind of set of typologies, if you will, um, in, in a new city like this. But I think it's interesting. I mean, for me, uh, you know, maybe it's a little too geeky to, to talk about scale and, and proportion or whatnot. But, you know, um, and maybe I'm making too many references to New York City, but that's where I'm that's where my life has been, <laughs> and a great place to learn. Quite all right. But but but, um, but like I, I think of like 9/11, and I think of like the south end of Union Square Park. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that, but that is like really ground zero for all of the. Um, it's where a lot of the, the kind of marches start and where they end. Um, that's where the kind of memorial right there at 14th Street was set up, um, and it's just really sh uh, surprising, if you will. Um, to look at how big that space is. It's not that big. Uh, Rockefeller Center is not that big. Um, Miami actually is not that big. I think that's a real positive thing, you know, like in, in from terms of land and geography. So what, in, what the reason I bring that up is I think it's encouraging. I think that there, I mean, that could be a project that uh, reimagines a parking lot, for example, um, and, and kind of looking at other, you know, Trafalgar Square, like some of the other kind of international Kind of plaza spaces and kind of overlaying those on communities and and oftentimes uh you'll find um you know where that should go kind of grows out of its context and the answer is kind of already there it's just there was never the political will or the or the, or the funding or 
um, all of these sorts of things. So this kind of goes back to my um, optimism about uh, the opportunities we have here. Um, because, uh, you know, especially, you know, as Maria was saying, like the landscape materials, they don't have to be expensive. I mean, there's really cool, interesting, innovative ways to reimagine some of these spaces and kind of create that. I mean, it could be a parking lot. It could be, all right, we're gonna we're gonna um, close down this one street, so I'm gonna be pedestrian. And and then you know the thing that I love most about public spaces and, and, and the hardest part too is like you kind of just you do the best you can to to design these and imagine them, but you really, once you put them out into the world, they become their own organism, right? So it's kind of and when you can see, especially if you you know if you've worked on some of these and you can see like the the communities um, starting to take ownership in these places. And they become sources of civic pride, and they foster uh, community interaction. And it's just a beautiful, it is the, well, the manifestation of democracy. Absolutely. It's the coolest yeah. thing ever uh, when it works, um, and it can. And this is this is the time to do it. And yes, um, absolutely. Um, we're we're short on time, so I want to let Ibru cool. get in. Oh, no worries. Thanks, Chris. Ibru, you want to uh, either address that question, or you have some final parting words for us? Um, yes, so I think as landscape architects, we are always trying to look how we can design gathering spaces and how we can bring people together. But during this recent events, we realized that bringing people together also increased the number of coronavirus cases. So, and it brings the discussion to my previous um, topic discussion about streets. I think streets really play an important role in these democratic uh, democracy and open space use. Uh, I, I don't feel like everything should be within the parks. So if we consider streets as our open spaces and, and in linear elements and they are continuous, they are long, maybe we can actually start thinking our streets, how we can actually utilize the spaces for reflection of democracy. It's very true, thank you. M Maria, parting words? Well, I, I just uh, would just, I think this is a big reminder to everyone, uh, once again, of the role of parks and public space. Uh, an integral role in recovery, in resilience, in reflection, all of those things that we are living in right now. Um, I think that, uh, you know, this is the first time in a very long time that collectively we're putting a premium on public spaces. And I think the evolution of public space uh, in, in this community is very young and it's burgeoning. And I would hope that they uh, continue to grow and continue to, um, to be priority with everyone. I think what we have seen is that once again, parks and public spaces have uh, proven to be critical to this infrastructure of need. Uh, and, um, you know, it, it just, it, it's, uh, it's part of who we are and what we do, right? We bring people together regardless of who you are and where you come from. So they're the great, greatest expressions of democracy. And once again, when we think about a system that is, goes beyond parks, but public spaces and natural cultural areas that are intricately connected through greenways and blueways and streets that are designed as linear parks, we can really rebuild that system in Miami-Dade County and fulfill our, you know, our, a long lasting vision of sustainability and resiliency and justice for everyone. So I, uh, I would make that a priority with everyone. Thanks, Maria. Listen, I wanna thank all three of you uh, for this fantastic discussion. Unfortunately, we're out of time. We'll have to do this again. Um, thank all of you for uh, uh, coming into the conversation. We really appreciate it. And we'll be answering some of your questions um, and send everything out. Uh, this will be, as, as Colleen had said, uh, will be recorded and posted on our website, uh, miamicad.org. And um, also it will, um, please follow us on Instagram, Miami underscore CAD. Uh, to find out about everything uh, that we have going on. So again, thank you all, and uh, thanks for your help, Colleen, and we'll see you all soon. Bye-bye.
missed it. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Chris and Ebru, Cheryl, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Was great. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, guys. You were Bye. great. Just, all right. Um, <clears throat> Okay.